Welcome back, geology fans. What an experience for geologists to realize that Wegener was right, and the surface of the Earth is in motion. What an even more exceptional experience to realize that Wegener was right, and there was once a time when South Carolina was neighbors with Morocco and Mauritania, and all land was joined in a supercontinent called Pangaea, which broke into Laurasia and Gondwana land by around 200 million years ago, and subsequently broke into today's continental configuration. What an even more exceptional experience it has been for us to realize that there were supercontinents before Pangaea. Today's story uses mostly matching mountain building deformation belts, greenstone belts often associated with ancient subduction zones, and paleomagnetism locked into ancient continental rocks to piece together the even deeper history of our planet's plate tectonics and the profound realization that this planet has had several supercontinents that congealed and broke apart over time. To start today, let's define tectonics. Tectonics is the deformation of a planet's uppermost solid crust due to various forces. Last episode, we investigated the forces due to internal heating and density differences that drive our planet's surface to not only deform, but break into separate lithospheric plates, which we can observe moving separately from each other with modern satellite technology. For this reason, we say that our planet's surface deforms mostly through plate tectonics. The evidence of this planet indicates that plate tectonics has been the deformation mechanism at the Earth's surface as far back as we can view. This more ancient story is told mainly in continents because, as we noted before, the ocean floor is recycled and thus does not keep the longest records on Earth. Seeing as today's story is told by the continents, let's take a moment to look at basic continental structure. At any place on the continents, if you drill down deep enough, you will hit Precambrian crystalline basement rock. This continental core is called the craton, from Greek kratos, meaning strength. These are the ancient, strong cores of our continents that have survived the long ages of collisions and rifting and give them their stable identities over time. Where the craton sits below sediments, it and the relatively undeformed layered sediments above are called the platform of the continents. Where the craton comes to the surface, we call it a continental shield. There are micro-shields, where the cratonic basement makes smaller exposures at the surface, such as Stone Mountain in Atlanta, Georgia, or Enchanted Rock in Texas. The other major landforms in continental interiors are the belts of more deformed basement rock and the sediments above, which we call orogenic belts. These represent the major mountain ranges of the present, such as the Rocky Mountains, and of the past, such as the Arbuckle Mountains seen here in Oklahoma. We also see down-dropped basins that accumulate much thicker sediment deposits, often derived from those orogenic mountain belts. As we noted in our discussion on Alfred Wegener, the continents do not stop at their shorelines. After all, we have evidence that sea level has gone up and down over geologic time, so it would be impossible to set the shore as the static boundary to the continents. The exception is when the shoreline is approximating the plate boundary, as in places on the west coast of the United States. A shoreline on the border of a tectonic plate is called a primary, or active, shoreline, and can make an exception to what we are about to say. The secondary, or passive, coastlines show the more typical edge of continents which don't drop off to the mean depths of the ocean as you leave the shore, but continue a very low, sloping surface, which is still underlain by the continental crystalline basement, and is thus still part of the continent itself. This is called the continental shelf, and is akin to the continental platform just underwater. As we get to the edge of the continental basement rock, the seafloor steepens and dives down over what is known as the continental slope to the abyssal plain four to five kilometers below sea level. We've seen that this abyssal plain is mainly broken by submerged volcanic mountains, mid-ocean ridges, and subduction zone trenches. But now we can look back and see that a continent is not just the land above water, but the craton, overlain by the sedimentary platform layers extending out to the edge of the continental shelves. This was one of the great insights for which we give credit to Alfred Wegener, that the continents should be joined back together at their continental shelf edges, not their present and impermanent shorelines. 
We turn our attention to the age of these continental features and quickly note the oceans are younger than the continental features and that the platform, shelves, and edges of the cratons are younger than their core shields. Taking a look at the major shields of the world, we note that these are all very old, and it makes sense to start our story with the oldest continental cores. As we go back in time, we pass the age of several of these cratonic shields and find the oldest coming in older than 3.5 billion years old. The Yilgarn Craton of Australia appears to have been the central core of the oldest supercontinent we can glimpse, Valbara. Not much of a supercontinent, as it was smaller than modern Australia when it was formed. There are many greenstone belts from this time which help us to piece this supercontinent of Albara together and represent subduction zones with volcanic belts which can lead to the growth of the first continents at their edges. By three billion years ago, Valbara had dissolved and reformed the supercontinent of Ur. And we still have less total land area than Australia, so growth and granitic outpourings continue to grow our land masses as Ur ruptures. By 2.7 billion years ago, we finally see something larger than Australia with Kennerland forming, and breaking up by 2.1 billion years ago. 1.8 billion years ago marks the formation of the supercontinent Columbia, which has significant growth on some plate boundaries. In my area of southwest United States, large cratonic sections called the Yavapai and Mazatzal were emplaced on the edge of the supercontinent Columbia, which finally broke apart around 1.5 billion years ago. With each jump forward, we see more and more detail and more and more of the modern continental cratons fully formed. The supercontinent of Rodinia forms around 1.1 billion years ago and breaks apart about 750 million years ago to quickly form Panosha, meaning all in the south, around 600 to 545 million years ago. Panosha is also called the Vendian supercontinent. In the history of this science, Rodinia was proposed first in 1970, then Panosha around 1976, but the older Columbia was not solidly identified until 2002, with Kennerland soon after in 2003. It is amazing enough to say that Wegener was right. There was a supercontinent that we allow him the privilege to name Pangaea. It did break apart into Laurasia and Gondwanaland, as he proposed, and then broke further to give us the world we know and hopefully love today. But to live as a geologist in an age when you realize there was not only one supercontinent, but a whole series of them, Valbara, Ur, Kennerland, Columbia, Rodinia, Panosha, and then Pangaea. What I see is constant movement, driven by seafloor spreading and subduction processes, moving plates with sticky continents around. When enough continents stick together, we get a supercontinent, which is going to have thicker, more thermally insulating crust above, trapping more and more of that convected asthenosphere heat below until instability forms, most likely along previous plate boundaries, breaking the continents attached to tectonic plates apart again. But nature is messy and can make some interesting breakups. The Florida Peninsula actually formed as part of the African continent, but got a divorce and ran off with the American continent as it split off from Africa and stole 500 million year old platform material. And all this reworking of the surface led to interesting variables for evolving life, and a recycling of the nutrients to allow that life to evolve long enough for us to realize this deep history of our planet. Is plate tectonics only found on Earth? What about other planets and their moons? We said tectonics is the deformation of a planetary body's surface, and as such we can say that all planets have tectonics. All planets show impact deformation from collisions with comets and asteroids, but some planets even show evidence of faulting and folding at their surfaces, or of full-on volcanic activity. So if we ask if other planets have tectonics... We have to say yes. But if we ask if other planets have plate tectonics, the answer is probably not. 
This really is a question for the four inner terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, but also for the rocky moons of Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus. Plate tectonics, the concept that our planet's surface is broken into separate plates that move independently causing various geologic processes at their edges versus their centers, is king on our planet, but up to now, none of our planetary neighbors have plate tectonics proven. There are suggestions that Mars may have started a plate tectonic system that stalled and died, but this geologist is not yet convinced that this is not wishful thinking. Why is the Earth so unique? If you add up all the mass of the four interterrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, it is surprising to find that almost half the mass mentioned there is contained in our planet Earth. We are a huge interterrestrial planet, partially by size, but mostly by mass and therefore density. Evidence suggests our planet-moon system was formed when an early Earth, perhaps before any continents had belched up to the surface, was hit by a Mars-sized object with a glancing blow that allowed the dense cores to meld together in the Earth, and lighter mantle crust-like material flew out to space and formed our moon. Such a massive Earth core would allow for more heat retention and more heat generation from more radioactive heavy elements to drive a greater convective asthenosphere, to drive the seafloor spreading of Harry Hess, to drive the plate tectonics of modern geologists, which explains the continental drift of Alfred Wegener. A quick glance around our planet tells us plate tectonics is still active today, and so a logical question is, Will there be another supercontinent? The answer is almost certainly yes. A tectonic investigative group called Paleomap made this future projection of our planet when the next supercontinent may form. You see that they stopped the rifting, driving Africa and the Americas apart, and brought those boundaries back together. This would require the Atlantic Basin to fail in the future and begin subducting at some point in the intervening ocean crust. It just happens that in the last few years of this recording, a new subduction zone being born has been discovered off the coast of the Canary Islands. Could this be the start of the Paleomap reversal? Could be, and very intriguing it is. Not all agree, though, and other future supercontinent reconstructions take on other shapes and positions. This, the orthogonal model, presumes continents pull apart and then reconvene at a 90-degree angle from where they were. Let's agree, the future is both predictable and uncertain. There is so much explanatory power in this plate tectonics theory that we will spend our next episode looking carefully at the types of boundaries between plates. We will classify these based on whether they are pushing together, pulling apart, or sliding past each other. The full explanatory power of plate tectonics will be explored next time. Here on Earth Explorations.